Harry Morton back on the show. Uh, last time you were on, we we geeked out about music and and just making music and beats and and all that. But let's let's actually get down to business in this one. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yes, sir. Um, so, you know, I know you as I, you know, the, several close friends of mine are in the podcast industry and you're, you're one of them, uh, who, who, you know, I think of you and your work as like all things podcast, you run lower street, which is, um, uh, you know, a, a fantastic, uh, podcast production company. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll let you sort of explain it a little bit, but my my take as the outsider looking in and i've been you know following your work for years now um it's been really amazing to see you grow lower street is like you know there are so many first of all you've got like the podcast hosting companies and podcast software out there yeah and then there are so, there's like a an ocean of these freelancers who are like podcast editors um podcast show notes writers things like that so you, mm -hmm. there, there's no shortage of, of those people around Right, but then there are a few companies who do podcasts at a much higher level, and I, I think of Lower Street in in that camp of like high production value, um, high end, just quality, interesting work. Um, yeah, I mean, can you tell like how do you describe like what what Lower Street is and where you guys sort of fit into the the podcasting world? Yeah, um, it, 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 I, so I started at the at the absolute ground floor i had no network no connections no right to start at the company that i did basically um, i mean well it wasn't really a company it was just me in my underwear in my bedroom um <laughs> saying saying we when it was very much just me um been there for years uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've all been there right so uh and and then at that point i i had no well, as I said, I no business experience before. I didn't really know what I was doing, and so I didn't know where to start. So, really, what I did was look around me and say, and see, okay, this is a skill set I have. I know I want to do something in podcasting. You know, as we've talked in the last episode about music, like um, I had that audio background and that pr that production kind of ability. So I knew this was where I wanted to play, but I didn't know kind of, you know, what that was going to look like in the long term. So I just looked around to see, okay, what. What is else? What else is here in this ecosystem? What are the other businesses doing this kind of thing? And basically, just copied them. Um, I mean, literally, I told Craig Hewitt when I met him at, uh, at um, uh, the first time I met him. I think it was two thousand sixteen, seventeen, at the um, Microconf in Portugal. I think mm. it was, and uh, and he did a talk there at the time because he just. I think he was just at the point of transitioning to kind of cast us. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and i remember and, i remember like finding him in the thing and going hey another podcast guy chatting to him and i was just like yeah by the way man like i literally just saw your pricing copied it and here we are um because <laughs> i was like well he's selling it so i guess it must be fine and that would be my starting point and and really it's just been a constant iteration since then and what i found was over the years that as you've rightly said there's no shortage of people serving kind of that end of the market or that kind of lower price point i actually i don't know what castos is at today so I, I can't comment on on what they're doing but like um back then at least um we were talking like you know monthly packages of a few hundred bucks kind of thing um and, and what i quickly realized is that that you know it was a very quick race to the bottom um and also as a creative person as someone that came from it from slightly more of an artistic kind of background like i wasn't it wasn't gratifying work to do either so i knew mm -hmm really the only opportunity for me to make the most of the skill set that i had the understanding i had creatively um and also hopefully create something that would have a bit more longevity in it and slightly more of a competitive advantage was to go up market and do kind of better and better work and when you and so started was it you like doing the audio work for clients it was yeah. yeah so um yeah it was literally i was doing everything i was writing show notes i was editing audio um i was you know yeah doing doing the whole thing Mm -hmm. um and uh, you know my, my first hires were people to write the show notes because that was my least favorite thing and that was all freelancers and contractors and um then i was hiring uh, audio editors and this was around the time i actually discovered what you were doing with audience ops and kind of took your course around productizing and really educated myself on on how to scale that kind of business um and it was probably yeah again one or two years into that where i'd had i've grown a, a, a bit of a team and we'd started to kind of like increase our pricing slowly and gently. And then I was like, okay, no, we really need to like actually go that did, next level up. Did you find, um, I mean, a, a, I'm guessing that something that, that prompted raising the prices 
it like did you find that the clients are um like people hiring podcast editing services it's it's sort of tough because podcasts themselves don't tend to make a lot of money right um so it's 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 sort of difficult to justify spending on on like a a more a relatively more expensive production arm yeah. if if you're mm -hmm. If you're like a business and you run a podcast as part of your content marketing strategy, like it's hard to invest a ton of money in, in, on, on there. Or if you're doing it like I am, which is like sort of like a fun side project. Again, yeah, sure. it's like not a major business investment. Yeah. Um, how do you like, did, did you run into that with your client base early on where we they, did where they didn't that. have like a, a high willingness to pay for that? Yeah. And the reason we run into, ran into that is because I was, where i was educating myself and the places i was hanging out on in real life and in twitter was like the microconf crowd right so like a lot of SaaS, um a lot of online bootstrapped entrepreneurs which is one of, they're my people but mm -hmm. what i learned very quickly is i don't want to sell to my people i want to just mm -hmm. hang out with my people drink beer with my people talk business with my people but not sell to them yep. um because you know i'm one of them myself i love these people but they're not always good customers because <laughs> they mm -hmm. want to do everything themselves and figure it out and do it cheap. So, yep. and which is exactly what I want to do. So I, I don't blame them for that. So, uh, but also that was tied into the fact that in my previous roles, when I was working, I was working on kind of corporate sales. So I was kind of like, it was, I was already in that kind of enterprisey corporate kind of language mm -hmm. was like part of my vocabulary. And I, I felt very comfortable with those conversations. And so suddenly the conversation is not around, how much are you going to charge me to edit this podcast so that I can try and get revenue for my bootstrap agency? But instead it was, um, how much are you going to come charge me to develop a coherent strategy for our, for the branding and audio for our large scale business. And that's a very different yeah. conversation. Um, and so, uh, you know, I didn't, it wasn't just like an immediate jump into that. And it, it's something that's very much iterated over time. Yeah. I mean, how, um, how did yeah. you make that transition? Cause I feel like there are so many, small you know freelancers consultants and even like small agencies who just they sort of just get stuck in that like mm. uh uh what is it like like a like a mouse wheel of yep. of of lower level clients and it's it's just like a completely different game to be selling to and networking with and yep. developing solutions for like these larger organizations like how did you even get the first contacts um, of of people who would be interested in buying high-end podcast projects with you? Like, how did you even make that switch? So, some of it was through cold email. So there were some, uh, there were some shows that existed already. And actually this is just changing actually that um, Apple are removing emails from RSS feed. So you can't like scrape every podcast in existence and like oh, wow. email people. But you, I didn't but even know that, that could, was possible. Yeah. yeah. So you can, you know, if you look at the RSS feed of a podcast, it, used to and probably still does on many feeds but you can turn that off so you know if you're into not getting spammed then you might want to look into that but um yeah the rss feed contains the publisher's email address and so you could kind of look at shows that you thought hey this represents the kind of client we want to work with it looks like they're doing some stuff but actually there's some opportunity for them to do better in this or that area i just did a bunch of cold email and this was probably again in like 2017 18 uh, probably 18 mm -hmm. um and that got me in the door with a couple of accounts and that and that was the sort of stair step i needed to give me that validation um and so that so that meant that those people those companies had already produced some podcast content right but they don't have like the right people working on it or they're looking for someone new to do something even better yep or i just thought hey this sounds shit and i can tell you how to make it less shit and mm -hmm. uh, obviously put that in an email slightly slightly more gently <laughs> yeah uh but but what and i think one of the ones that we got that was a real win was actually not a branded podcast it was a podcast here in the uk called secret leaders and which is like an entrepreneurship interview show and they were part of this wave they came along before like diary of a ceo came and bulldo bulldozed the rest of the uk entrepreneurship podcasts to the ground mm -hmm. um and uh and they were doing really well at the time and so i i came on with them at like their season two and we helped them kind of produce the show make it better and they started to kind of get to the top of the the charts basically and so that meant i could then email everybody and say we produced the uk's number one business podcast mm. that was a huge that was a huge kind of thing and then, um, you, and then you, it sounds like you you stuck to cold email or, or just email I, I, outreach no, in general. No, I didn't. It just, it, I, that was probably a period of kind of three months where I did that. I got a few accounts 
okay and some really crappy ones as well so like it did so it, that was enough mm-hmm. to, to make me stop but the mm-hmm. ones that i did i you know i was very lucky in one or two of those ones being like pretty pretty helpful the other thing that that happened i think was um just like my 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 experience has been saying yes all the time and then being around for long enough to for things to come back around so like if someone says can you do this are you able to do this and it feels like it's somewhere in the wheelhouse of the trajectory we want to be headed in i was just like yeah and very Mm -hmm. confidently said yes even though i had absolutely no effing clue how we were going to get it done and we'd figure it out later Mm -hmm. um and so that allowed allow me to do certain things. And then the other thing. And is so is that like, like more ambitious? Like, like, so people are coming mm. to you, like, we want to do something bigger and better, more creative, more yeah. different. Cause me, can, on social, can you help I'm us do that? You should do that. Right. So I'm saying you should do this on, yeah. on, on social. Meanwhile, like we're not actually doing it, but, I, but honestly, like this works, I imagine, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> you know, uh, saying it with authority and, and, uh, and so people would kind of come to us go, with that kind of agree with that vision and would, and would kind of say that they wanted to do it and we did it. Um, but then there were some clients who one account in particular worked with, with him, um, at one company, he then moved to a much larger organization in the same role and immediately brought us along with him. And then that just opened us up to this massive account. And that was another, and then we put their logo on our website and then all of a sudden it's, it's been, yeah, it's one of those, you know, whatever, whatever, yeah. seven I year love... overnight successes, you know, it's just a stair step Rob walling approach, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that when I was running audience after that happened a few times where we had a really good client for like a year or two. And that person is like a head of marketing at some company. Then they leave and they go to another company and they, yep. and they like immediately recommend us over there. And that, yep. that, that was always like, like ch- such a nice bonus. Cause it's like, you, you know, you're getting a, you're, you're converting a new client, a, a much better client. And it was like the easiest sales process because they just bring right. you right in, you know? But you only get that if you stick around long enough for those things to come back around. And I think that's yeah. just like, a, a, I, I consider that to be an enormous factor. I've been so lucky, like so much of what's happened in Lower Street's progression has been just for good fortune. Mm-hmm. But I also put a lot of that good fortune around to just like not giving up for ages. Because yep. I just, yeah, I huh. think that's a big, a big thing. What does your, uh, what does Lower Street, uh, what, what does the team look like today? How is it made up? Um, so we uh, are onboarding our 19th employee tomorrow. Oh, wow. Um, and we're all full time. So I kind of moved away from the contractor setup some time ago when I when I just decided that we I wanted um, that consistency, that buy in, that culture that we wanted to cry, try and create. Um, so we, we moved away from the contractor thing into full time employees, um, 19 of us now, but we should be 22 actually by January, like it's been kind of an insane, amazing uh, kind of court year, basically. So, what are like the the main roles of, across the team? Uh, so, the main role as we move again, as we kind of have moved from just being like, we'll edit your podcast into we're going to develop a show, we're going to write it and script it and all that kind of stuff. We moved away from kind of audio editors and more to producers, and so those mm-hmm. folks might be from public radio, they might be from um, kind of journalism backgrounds. But that, that's the bulk of our workforce is the folks that are like writing and scripting. We obviously have audio folks as well. So we have a team of now three. We just hired another uh, audio engineer and they're doing like cutting tape, sound design, mixing, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and then so in like the production. What? Oh, yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. No, I was just going to say in the production team, we've got producers who are producing. Then we have executive producers that kind of oversee those producers, um, but also manage their own shows. And now we've just included... I mean, I'm giving you the full thing, but um, like a production manager who oversees that whole department and make sure that everybody's like following set procedures and stuff, because that's what we found is like, I am, I, despite me watching every one of your videos, Brian, I am the, just the worst at process, like, cause you're the process <laughs> guy. And I'm like, I gotta be more like Brian, but I can't do that stuff. So we, it's you know, funny. We I want to ask you about process in a, in a second. Uh, um, but yeah. when it comes to producing like a high end. Mm-hmm. uh quality podcast but i i'll get to that in a second so sure um uh where do i want to go with this the so when a client comes to you correct me if i'm wrong is it like completely different in every different client's case or does a client or is there a, some sort of standard thing where or like would a client come to you and say we want to do a big new season and like do they come to you with the concept like we have this idea for a podcast we want 
Lower Street to make it happen? Or does a client come to you and say, we know we need to invest in our brand and get, be out there. Lower mm -hmm. Street, can you come up with ideas for us? Like, how does yeah. that work? So we're doing um, a bit of both. So at the, at the, let's say the lower end of the folks that we serve, they come to us and they go, we want to produce a podcast. And to them, a podcast is two talking interview style show, right? Mm -hmm. And so my job is then to educate them on, here's what that could be. And here's why that's awesome. And then coming up with ideas of how we frame that and package that in the right way. But when we're doing the bigger kind of more <clears throat> interesting or kind of more, oh, what's not interesting, the more kind of uh, creative uh, different formats that we're creating. Like for example, we're working on a podcast with a client about climate change for COP27. And instead of wanting to make that show about, um, this sounds like I'm pitching my business. That's not what I'm here to do. But, but anyway, I'm just gonna, no. Please, I was actually going to gonna ask you for for examples. Like okay. what what is like when we say like high end, more creative podcast. Like what what is that? Yeah. So they they, they want to make a um, uh, a climate change podcast. They're a big global brand, so it's important for them to stand out. Um, so what we wanted to so the, the targets at COP27 are all about 2050. So they, they came to us. And so to answer your question before, they came to us with this concept and we're making it happen. I want us to get more involved in going to companies and proactively pitching creative ideas. But this one in particular came to us. They said, we want to we want to set this podcast in 2050. And it's like, how oh, we that's got cool. Here. It's how we got here. So it's fictionalized. So we've got like actors that are playing like people on the ground and it's around climate change. So one of them's the, the episode that's out right now is all about um, like wind farm islands that they're creating in Denmark, like off oh, the wow. sea in Denmark. I want to listen. And to so that. there's like an engineer on the ground on one of these wind farms that doesn't exist right now. Um, and so, so that's this, kind of been really super fun. So this client comes to you and says, "We have this basic concept of we we want to have a show that that is in the future in 2050." Yeah. Go. And, and exactly. it, it was, and was it like you figure out all the so gaps. you guys like yeah. source all the actors and, all, and yeah, everything so we're sourcing like... the actors we're figuring out how do we interview modern current day professors who are leading on these technologies and feature them in that podcast in a way that is makes sense for that hmm. you know we're setting it in 2050 but we're talking to an expert in 2022 so like how does that work um so they're like playing themselves in the future or we're like recording like here's some material from back in 2022 kind of thing um, so it's so like the job of a producer to to get in the weeds and search for professors who happen to know about this and we can interview them and is that yeah. what a producer essentially does exactly yeah yeah exactly so they're yeah they're exactly that finding all the contributors doing all the research on the content writing the scripts and because it's fictionalized that means we're writing more or less every word like there's obviously some interview mm -hmm. material there but like a good probably 60 percent of the material in those episodes is like stuff that we've literally written this is actually the the process thing I wanted to ask about. I was just asking someone else about this at a conference I was at. Um, I like I would love to to launch a new podcast uh, as as like a brand project from from my team at, at Zip Message, right? Yep. Um, and I I would like to do something that's a little bit better and different than just a typical interview show mm -hmm. because the interview shows are what the, the only super basic thing that i know how to do right um from, yep. from a process standpoint i know how to invite guests invite them get it edited published all that um but i would and, and I, w I would like this show to be something that i'm not i don't have to be on the mic like maybe my my marketing person claire can can run with this yeah maybe. um or or someone can and so my my question is, could I've seen it sort of work both ways, right? Like th there's one approach where a journalist type of person um, or a producer goes out and interviews maybe a couple different people and gets a lot of footage mm -hmm. in in a general subject matter direction, but we don't know what's going to be the most interesting. We're going to get mm -hmm. hours of of recorded footage and then pull pieces out of that and, and turn it into a narrative style ep set of episodes. Like right. there's that, which seems like a lot of work um, yep. and a lot of like guessing and, and, the, and right, a lot of luck. You got to hope a lot of luck stuff. Yeah. The, the other approach would be the opposite way. And, and this is how I'm thinking about it is like, if I, if, if someone on my team is a fantastic writer and storyteller, have mm -hmm. them write an episode first and do their own research, just like they're writing an article, or writing an ebook or something like that and figure out along the way, like, all right, if we're in this section, we're going to need some quotes from these experts. So I know we have an, an intro section about 
climate change, let's find a climate change expert to, to just ask them two or three questions, record it, get their voice in, incorporate it into the episode and yeah, like and piece it together that, that way. The benefit of that as well is that you're then leading the narrative. You're, you're telling the story. It's not just like, re, re, like you're not just going to get Rand Fishkin out and like have Rand talk about clever shit. And then you kind of go, Hey, look, it's brought to you by us. So I guess we're clever too. It's like, no, mm-hmm. this is, these are our, these are our thoughts. And by the way, here are some quotes to pull, to back that up from some interesting people. Yeah. Um, yeah, is that so, how how you guys generally do it? Like you have someone write the episode and then seek out the people and the quotes to Yeah, I mean it really it super depends. Like some some inter- some shows we do are still interview based and our job is to plan the interview so that there's a good narrative there and then write scripts to kind of link it all together to tell more of a story but around what is effectively a one-on-one interview. And so best to give that some context like the best example of that is how i built this it's, it's just guy Raz mm-hmm. talking to one other person but they tell stories around that between the segments of interview to make it more nuanced and interesting um so that's a lot of what we do but then we also do a lot of these documentary style ones where we do the process exactly as you've said the other thing i want to pick up on is that we have worked with a client that did like they basically recorded everything for the last two years of them trying to raise venture money mm. every interview they've done every conversation every like i'm waking up at 3 a.m and i'm going to record myself into my voice memos yeah like the reality show style exactly they basically wanted to make gimlet startup but Mm -hmm. not um yeah and we went through literally (laughs) i've done that myself a couple i I literally have a couple of dropbox folders when i was going through like i recorded like maybe five or six private episodes of when i started to sell a business and i never released it I, i thought that i would like piece it together like a documentary style thing um, yeah, I, I would encourage I, you to consider I, that again because that would it's, i mean it's i burned good. out like i i got like i think i re- so I, I was selling um audience ops and i th- i think i started recording episodes like that for the first like two or three weeks of it and yeah. and i kept up with it and then i just got so burned out that and then yeah. it dropped off but um, so that show I will name drop though. It's called uh, Unicorn Launcher by a company called Vigo, and it is really, really good. And I'm not that's not bragging about our work. It's just they've told a really cool story and they've been very open about it. And that leads me to say something that I think I'm really I'm really passionate about at the moment and what I want to talk about a lot in general about content is is this idea of being noteworthy. Like I'm really interested, mm-hmm. like we can't just make more noise. There's plenty of noise and we have to make stuff that is genuinely valuable um and so i think that that extra effort recording all that stuff that you've recorded about your exit is is noteworthy that is different like people aren't doing that work and, yeah. and i think i think that's really huge i i really um, think so. i dude you're, you're exactly right we were talking offline uh just earlier today about like why why do i do this show or why why should anyone invest in a in a podcast and it's um I think this idea is starting to to make the rounds now that like look you're you're it's not an audience builder and right. um but I I feel like you you touched on it like the best possible outcome of having a podcast out there in the world I think is people recommending it to other people right um because it's so interesting and so different and unique you know, yeah, um, exactly. It's it. You know, you you can't. It's it's not like producing blog content, which will get just get found in, in search engines and stuff like that. It it has yep. to be talked about, and the way to for it to exactly. be talked about is for it to be unique and high qual high quality. Uh, like production value, kind of table stakes. Yeah, that's table stakes. Like it has to. You have to have amazing story in there. Yep. You know, I completely agree. And so that makes what makes me want to come back to what you're thinking about with this show that maybe producing with with Claire on your team. Like I think it'd be really interesting. There was a, a a brand, and I can't remember what they're called. They're like something star, and it's basically a piece of tech in your car that if you get in an accident, you press this button and someone comes to help you. I forget. Oh I yeah, um, uh, OnStar. OnStar. Started, OnStar. Yeah. So they they created a podcast that was all about um, uh, strangers doing acts of kindness. So basically, they're like, okay, what are we about, OnStar? We're about like we're we're about helping you in that moment of need when you never thought you'd ever need to need that moment of need and and so they tell stories of of kind of people that help complete strangers in these moments because that's effectively what on star is about doing and the, these amazing wonderful stories came out about mm. um you know people giving kidneys to complete strangers and then them meeting up years later and you know this kind of stuff and so i wonder what the the async because async is just like a thing that's just like 
yeah it's well we're coming to be now and i wonder what the stories are like what are those what are those well, like i'm gonna start to I'm going to start to get some free consulting out of you while while we're recording here. <laughs> no. um, so the uh, like we're we're starting to focus on coaches as yep. as the the best customer, the best user of of Zip Message. They're they're using it for for async communication with their clients. We we just launched this thing called Coach Club, which is a community for for coaches. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, a newsletter for coaches. We have that going now. And the next piece of of that whole brand strategy would be like a, a Coach Club podcast, like a a podcast. Maybe we, we would call it something better than that, but like, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know what, what it would be. I don't know what the topic would be, but it, but it needs to be interesting and noteworthy for right. professional coaches. Right. Um, well, and, and I and think like, what's interesting and noteworthy about all stories is like personal human stories, right? So the reason yeah. I brought the OnStar thing up is that they are like deeply human stories and we just can't help but care about them and listen to them. And so I would say that like, uh, yeah, I just wonder what stories there are that can only happen asynchronously between two people. Uh, that's that's something that's unique from a, the way that you would interact with a coach one on one in in a in the same room as uh, as each other. Yeah, I, I bet there's some amazing of your of your users. They've got some amazing client stories and I, yeah, I, and like, like client transformations, and, like um, yeah, and I don't uh, know. like cause, like getting back to the process thing and getting back to yeah. what you were saying about like you know bootstrappers who try to do this. <laughs> Che yeah. you know cheaply like like yeah. i you know where my mind goes is like this is a thing that i think is worth investing in like i would i would like a podcast to exist from our like brand arm of what we're doing on the on the marketing stuff yeah um i I'm, i know we can't afford lower street to, to, to do it um so that's where it i start to try to piece together in my mind like how could we do something like this so like you know, Claire on my team. We also have a Aaliyah on my team and, and Aaliyah is listening to this because she's actually editing this podcast. Oh, nice. um, Hi, Aaliyah. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and she's been do doing an amazing job doing it. Um, so we've got these uh, awesome, creative, talented people. Um, and we do have uh, some really great coaches who are now participating in, in Coach Club, a lot of great users of, of Zip Message. Um, I wonder if someone like Claire can, and she's an amazing writer and storyteller, so she could write an episode, a, a narrative of, of like a focus, a topic, mm -hmm. um, uh, literally the script she, she could write, she could even do it, uh, you know, record it. And then maybe even using zip message, we can go out and say like, all right, to support the story, we need quotes or voices from two or three coaches who've experienced this or that. Mm -hmm. Claire can send a zip message to those people, ask them the question, get them to record their response. We take that footage, Aaliyah edits it all together in, into a really great show, and we package it up, and we become the next uh, NPR or uh, <laughs> totally. You know, no, I love um, it. I think that's I think that's great. And it, the thing, it, like the challenge, of course, is if, if Claire's doing it, like she's got a ton of it. Like it's it's a lot of work, and so mm -hmm. carving out the time for her to do that. But I think, um, yeah, I, I think there's 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 definitely something and I, you know again as a SaaS product you've got so many users and they're all creating content as they're using your your product yeah. uh it feels like there's just like a wealth of material out there that you could tap into in one way or another yeah and i mean not to not to like promote zip message which of course i am but like <laughs> uh it, I, it does seem like a good tool for asynchronously just gathering quotes yeah, to support for sure. a narrative for a specific episode without having to go through the time of sitting down for an hour, two hour recording, and then the time of like sifting through all that material and just editing it out, like instead just using zip messages, like just just get a 30 second quote from this one person and we'll use that, you know? Right, um, totally. It's interesting. Love it. Do you, so are you guys, um, I think you are, right? Like, are you producing your own stuff? Like your own podcast? We, and we like have that? in the past produced a couple of shows and that's kind of basically been on the back burner because we've been, it's classic cobbler's shoes problem we're just like constantly busy doing client work and then it takes away from the stuff that's that's our own um but uh we've just made some key hires on the on the team from my perspective and that's freeing up much more of my time or at least i hope so um and so my goal for next year is definitely to get on the content side of things and be much more active on linkedin and twitter but also start producing some some shows so i'm excited i mean as a I'm, I'm sure you've thought of this but like as a follower of, of your work i think it would be super interesting to hear sort of what you were just describing about the whole process 
of mm -hmm. of what goes into creating a high level, high quality, high creative um, podcast. Because like I I've really been interested in this idea of you know um, SaaS companies as as media companies, media brands. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've been fascinated with what companies like like Wistia have have been doing with like their whole range of different shows that they produce. Um, like Profit and well doing the same thing. Profit well and like all these like Help Scout is getting into it. Uh, Mailchimp mm -hmm. has done some interesting stuff. A lot of that's like video based, uh, but yeah. um, you know, it it's like I I still don't have a concept in my mind of like how does that stuff actually get created and and like executed you know right. um, yeah so I, I feel like you you and, and lower street would be perfect to like educate the world and show the world like how that stuff actually comes together you know yeah maybe i should do that i've always been reluctant to because there's just so many podcasts about podcasting and i just didn't want to add more more to the pile you know so i've always been reluctant to do that but uh but yeah maybe that's uh maybe it's something i've got to get over and just uh yep. just start doing it yeah we'll see well, Harry, this is uh, this has been really fun to talk about a whole bunch of stuff. We'll have to get you to get you to come back on here. We'll we'll find something else to geek, a, a geek out about. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. I'll uh, gladly talk about uh, business and music any day. So yeah, it's been, it's been good stuff. Day. All right, and of course, folks can uh, can follow along at, at Lower Street. We'll get everything uh, linked up in the show notes. Um, all right, thanks, Harry. Sweet. Cheers, mate.